Amen. Hope you had a good five-minute break, health break. Um, after this will be lunch, so you'll have a, a massive break after that. But as we're continuing to talk about it, what was your question? What was something that was activated in you as I started talking about it? I, I, I talked about conflict. It's a serious thing. It can bring down every single thing that we're doing. And it's one of Satan's greatest tools that we use. How do I know? He keeps using it again and again. You know, when your kid's playing video games and if that one move works and you win, that's what he's doing. Conflict. Why did Jesus have John 17, longest prayer? What is it all about? Unity. What's the enemy of unity? Well, conflict. Bad conflict. And as we start looking at this, we're talking about the go conversation. Can we use it in our own context to perhaps put a mapping of how some of our, con our con conversations have went? You know, sometimes we can do a post-mortem and take a look at how that disaster happened, and we can cut it up and say, oh, that's how it died, as opposed to saying, I don't know, like, and, and it doesn't work, because I can't learn, and so instead of failing, you know, I want to, why not fail forward? You know, you fail, you do better. You fail, and you do better. That's just how it works, right? Most of what I learned is because somehow, um, you know, I, I'm a strong believer in the Bible that says, you know, what stupidity should cost money. Stupidity should cause pain. And hopefully enough losing money and pain will maybe to go, okay, I don't think I want to do it that way again. Right? And so as we start thinking about conflict, the way I'm going to kind of map it out for us, and once again, I'm not going to go extensively into this, but what it is, it piques your interest to go, oh, that's a good step to think about. And you can do them in different orders, but some of them have to be done in the right order. And the first step is setting the stage and naming the topic. How many times you walk into the situation, you don't even know what it's about. But it doesn't stop you from giving information and advice, right? It doesn't. Part of it is because of our culture. Minister, everything. That's all we do. It doesn't matter if you have training in it, right? But if somebody were to say, hey, can you do this brain surgery? But just a little thing. Just a brain surgery for me. No, I'm not trained for that. But conflict resolution mortgages, all that stuff. People go to school for this stuff. You do it. Well, conflict resolution, it's just easy to do it. The person's been divorced three times. Like, it's, there's something, the life, right? The idea is not for us to be able to do everything, but here's the question sometimes before we go in. Who is the, are you the best person actually to have this conversation? You might have all the skills, but this kind of person drives you crazy. I know Christians, we all love each other and stuff like that. Uh-huh, sure. That's why Paul and Barnabas had a fight, and no one gets to resolve it. It never says anywhere who was right and wrong. How irritating of God to do that. And I've read treaties, well, Paul was right because of this and this. And you know, Barnabas is right because he, yeah, yeah, show me the verse. Nowhere. Nowhere. They did dynamics, of, you know, relationship dynamics with John Mark, blah, 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 blah. Nowhere does it say it. Why? Because God wants to leave it there and say, yeah, even committed Christians, Barnabas, the son of encouragement, Paul, who wrote lots of the New Testament, can have a disagreement. Some people say sentimentality. I don't know what it was. Whatever it is. It's not going to be the first question I'm going to ask Jesus. I want to know about JFK. I want to know about the dinosaurs. I want to know about all that stuff. <laughs> UFOs. But I, that's one of them. I said, okay, what? Who was right there? They couldn't have a conversation together. One was an apostle. The other one converted the apostle. What chance do I have if this brother somehow triggers my life? And that sister triggers my life. The problem is, but bro, I'm the only one to do that. Yeah, but that's a structural problem. Why are you the only one that can do that? Right? Are you the only one? What did Joel say? Are you the only one that can study the Bible? You know there's a problem, right? If you're the only one who can do with the conflict, no problem? Yeah, problem. Absolutely. Some of the sisters are not involved in the training, but they have to be. Because it's always awesome, brothers sitting down with a bunch of sisters having conflict. That's not going to work. In our culture, it doesn't work. In the world, it works because there's, this, there's an egalitarian mindset. There really is. But oftentimes, in our culture, it doesn't work. So who are you the best person? Do you even ask that question? Are you the best person to have this conversation? Are you? See, sometimes we wait until we realize we're not the best person in order to go, uh-oh. Would you think it's wise to be looking for a firework extinguisher at Walmart while your house is on fire? It's always nice to have one, know how to use it, and press that little greeny thing that should pop up because it's telling you that it still works. It's not just for decoration. It's nice to have all this stuff when you're not in survival mode. You're in development mode for your church to find this. How do I know? It's because this was developed before they gave out the Ten Commandments. 
You have to figure that out. All the theologians, you, you tell me why. That it was brought by a non-Christian and it was developed before the Ten Commandments. Seems important to me. Seems important to me. Right? I mean, like, I'm not the brightest light in the harbor, but I, I, I figure that out. It's before, right? And so at the end of the day, even when to have that conversation, what if this person is going through the roughest time of their life? What if you're going through the roughest time of your life? To go in and have that conversation, it's like running a marathon. What did somebody's running ultra marathons? Can you imagine shooting yourself in the foot before you run that marathon? Because I just want to be more gritty. Listen, <laughs> life and problems will come my way. I don't have to look for it. And so for me, thinking, life, timing, events, have we considered those things? Because we do that, right? We do that for every other thing, except when we get amped up, sometimes, depending on how we approach conflict, the lens that we approach it with, we're trying to manage our own anxiety by, i got to get rid of this, i got to get rid of this, i got to get rid of this, and without understanding that because you're like that, you shouldn't go in. I've been fired from jobs professionally, not fired, but taken off a project because I just... And I know who presses my buttons. I know. It's the same kind of person. I'm not going to tell you who they are, but the same kind of person. And I already know. But each work, the workplace where I am, we each know our triggers. I remember one of my coworkers, I put my hand on her knee because she was losing her mind in front of one of these guys. I was like, hey, hey, why don't we take a break? She goes, I don't need a break. Oh, we need a break. Like right now. Because she was going to torpedo it. And you got to know because she was, you know, I was so triggered. And she didn't see it. Until it's too late. You know, you know, in counseling, we call it the amygdala hijack. Fight, flight, or freeze. Ah, and that doesn't work, right? And so even where, bro, let's meet in a coffee shop with everybody's around. Let's talk about the deepest, like, what are you doing? Even during, during this time, let's go to someone's house. They got kids and dogs and goats running around. <laughs> like, I don't know why it wasn't a success. Someone making it safe and free of distraction. Do you ever have people, hey, come on over to my house. Are you sure your house is safe? Well, of course it's safe for you, but what about them? The environment. Yeah, you know, it was just me and four other brothers going to talk to you. Wow, that's not... The... Are they going to get jumped or are they going to get talked to, right? And so the mindset is, if we go and bring it to our brother, what if our mindset is to bring him to his knees instead of to his senses? Big difference between the two. Considering these things, why am I doing this is a huge deal. If I'm, you know, because we're all fooled, you know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not mad. Look, look how calm I am. No, because inside the heart's deceitful. If I got a history with this person, would they got a history with me? I may not be the best person. 99% of the time, when you're the wrong person, it will fail because they already don't trust you and you're going to go in and do a little bit of surgery in their heart, right? You know this. Studying the Bible is the same kind of thing. You know when someone's not right. When you consider somebody, it goes, wow, that's a person. I think this brother will be great. This sister will be great. We don't do that for conflict. Well, you're the minister. You're the Bible talker. You're the elder. You should go in and do it. Yeah, okay. How's that working for you? Because how come I get the phone calls? And we do a little bit of personality assessment. Not a formal one. Say, what, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, yeah, you can see why that's a disaster. Because you put gunpowder next to a flame. I don't know. I don't know what happens. It blows up. Also, this is one of the more important things. What are you actually addressing? You know, that brother was being a jerk. Yes, because anybody know Hebrew or Greek, Aramaic? What does jerk translate into? Because it's not in the Bible. What do you mean? Because a jerk over here is a different jerk over there. Look, what do you mean by that? What are the biblical words you're actually bringing in? Is this actually the real problem? You know, somebody in a Harvard professor, it was attributed to Einstein, but it's not. I snoped it. But this Harvard professor once said this. If I had an hour to solve a problem that my life depended on, I would spend two-thirds of that time defining the problem. When we walk into a situation, we don't set the stage real well. We don't even know what we're talking about. And what happens is what we call scope creep. Do you ever have those five-hour appointments? You don't, you, in the end, you don't even know what, like, why are we here? And all it is, you start getting angry and upset. And then they point out, well, you're angry with me. Yeah, because on the third hour, Right? Like, like, I don't know what's going on. If you can't discuss this in an hour, hour and a half, you're probably missing, the, you're missing something. You're not sure what it is. And so once again, because you're the minister, the women's ministry leader, you're the usher, song leader, kingdom kids person, all that, you don't got a lot of time to spend doing this. You don't. And then you start to, I know, you start to resent the person a little bit. Just a little bit. But what if there are people that are necessary in your church? Because you don't got a lot of fat on the church that, that's small. And you need every person. 
And that person, you got to avoid them in the swath of people that they were surrounded around them. What do you do? Yeah, I'll tell you what you got. You got a, a small beginnings of a church split. They may not split physically, but their heart's not with you. Your heart's not with them. Fun times, right? Anyway, he's like, how do you know such things? Because I've been in my church in Winnipeg for 22 years, and I'm still alive. That tells you something about the patience of the people, right? Because 22 years is a long time to be in one spot, right? And so at the end of the day, what, have you, it's something to consider before you even go. If you don't, you might find the results are not as great as you want them to be, for sure. The next thing is asking someone for the perspective and listening. I know you know this already, okay? Everybody know this, but we don't do it. Because I know already, because I'm a mind reader. I'm a minister. I know, I know what you're thinking. Even if I do know what you're thinking, like Jesus. You know the crazy thing about Jesus? He still asked, even though he knew. Something to throw at you. In the book of Genesis, chapter 3, some things happened there, okay? They ate the fruit, oh no, right? How did God deal with the greatest sin? First thing he did was, hey, where are you? What did you do? You notice he asked questions? What, you think God lost them? Oh, what did, oh there, guys, is that what happened? He asked, look at, look at Genesis 3, listen to the things that he asked. Where are you? Why would that be the first question that you would ask? Have your kids ever done something? Was that your first question? What are you doing? Like, you're, you're, like you're, blah, 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 blah. Meanwhile, we could easily take the foot out of our mouth only to stick the other foot in, right? With God, who knows all, ask these questions. What a great counseling. What a great uh, counsel for us to be able to ask. Hey, wh like, where are you at right now? What did you come from? How did you get here? Those are God's spaces from Genesis chapter 3. And then throughout, you can read it, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, dealing with conflict. How do you deal with that? Amazing things all through the Bible. But when you ask with their perspective and listen, right, it's pretty powerful. And so I, I, write, I write a couple of acronyms on that you don't have to worry about uh, extensively. But there's a great author, and I'm going to introduce him at other courses. His name is Bill Eddy, B-I-L-L-E-D-D-Y. -L -L -E -D -D he's not a disciple, but he's a very interesting character. He's a social worker. He's a mediator. And he's a lawyer. Talk about a platypus of a human being, right? That doesn't make sense. Nor How many social workers are, are, are lawyers? Like, they don't seem to go in the same place. But he wrote a book called Biff, Brief, Informative, Friendly, and Firm. He also wrote another book called Five Types of People That Can Ruin Your Life. You're like, those are godsends for a lot of some of the stuff that's going on. Because what it is is he teaches this material of how to actually ask for someone for the perspective, being very brief, being very informative, being friendly, but being firm. Right, but without condemning the person. So as we look at this, say we ask them and we think the problem is about this and this and this, but most times, if not, they'll give you new information for you to go, oh, thank God I didn't jump and shoot first and interview after, right? But unfortunately for me, I usually shoot first and then try to interview after. It seems to not work very well. So I come in knowing what I think I know, and I don't know what I know. I don't ask questions. I don't check understanding. I don't paraphrase. I don't say, hey, is this what this is? You know, if I were to say this sentence, tell me, tell me you, you, what, what you think I mean. The Winnipeg church loves hurting people. <laughs> the Winnipeg church loves hurting people. Hurting people? Hurting, hurting people? Like, yeah, what do I mean? You're like, do you... See, in context, well, no, he's a godly man, so he loves, they help hurting people, versus we hurt people. Same sentence, different meaning. When somebody says, bro, you know, I, 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 I don't think I want to be a Christian anymore, then we whip out all these scriptures, like, what do you mean by that? What are you talking about? Do you just feel like not being a Christian? Do you actually did something? Like, like what's going on? Is there a body somewhere? Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> And we don't ask those questions, and we're whipping up passage after passage after passage, only to find out, oh, I miss that. And so I like using this analogy. On those kids' drawings, those little dots connect the dots, it's key that you have the same dots, I find. It's key those numbers are ordered the same way. Because if not, I can be like, hey, Tom McCurry, bro, I got this amazing picture of a Christmas tree. And Tom's like, what kind of fool are you? This is an amazing tarantula. And I'm going to argue with him that his picture's wrong, he's wrong, he's a bad man. Without, can, can, I, can, I check, can I check your dots? Oh, you got completely different dots, different numbers. 
So we're both right. You ever seen that situation? Well, instead of polarizing and become tribal, what happens? Ask them a bunch of questions. Now, who doesn't know this? We know way more than we do, don't we? We know this is the second step. But instead, we'll jump in trying some other way, but it doesn't really work because we're trying to address a problem that's not really there. Here's something to think about. This is something that I can't go over tons, but even understanding the discerning, what level of conflict is happening right now? After they share, sometimes what you hear from them is something called an intrapersonal conflict. Something's going on with them. Do you know why a lot of people have interpersonal conflict between two people? It's because they got stuff going on inside. And so they can't fix it with the other person because you can't fix you with, by helping another person get fixed. That's not how it works. And so sometimes you might have to call in the right person to say, hey, this is not support that we can give you. But here's people that we know. We can call it Jennifer Kanzen. We can call it Tim Summerlin or all the plethora of human beings. Kyle, who did a great job on trauma. When we're not trauma-informed, and those are big words we use about how someone's triggered by things that we say, things that we do, and we don't realize we're trying to help them get right with us, but they're not even right with themselves. And so next thing you know, we're not assessing the right level of conflict. Here's the problem. What if it's a systemic conflict? And you see this all the time with these Karen folks on, on TV. Did you ever see them? Right? This, this woman is arguing with this Walmart clerk about the supply side demand of big screen TVs and, and commodities, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, hey, I get like 11 bucks an hour. Like, like, I'm trying to check out your eggs here. Wrong person to talk to. So we're trying to address a larger ICOC problem, and you are going to be the one that fixes. Like, what are you talking about? Like, uh, and so why keep having that conversation and saying, you know what? I, I validate. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Okay. Guess what? Wrong person to talk to. But can we have this conversation? Is it something we can actually change? Or something we can focus on what we can change? Because what happens is, where the area we have the most control is intrapersonal. Where we have least control is the system. But what, what if you can't discern the level of conflict? And so I've seen people talk about this. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, can you snap a finger and make the system change? No, then what, why are you having this conversation? If it's to vent, no problem. But if they're asking you to fix it, you can't. But what if you really try and then realize, I can't fix it, and you go back and have this expectation, mismatched expectations? Other things, how far is this conflict gone? The best place we want to have it when people are in conflict is problem solving. Hey, you got a problem, I got a problem, let's talk together, let's fix it. We will always want to be there, okay? But when you can't fix the problem, all of a sudden, you know what? I don't focus on the problem anymore. You become the problem. So this is what it looks like. Me and Josue are on the same side of the table, and the problem, not Jared here, but the problem is over here. And we're focused on the problem. But if we don't get that solved right, all of a sudden, Josue's on the other side of the table, and Josue's the problem. And all of a sudden, I start multiplying issues. And Josue, I don't like his pants. I don't like his family. I don't like all, and it has nothing to do with the original thing. Right? I don't even know Josue very well, but that's what I'm saying. But guess what's going to happen? I, I, you know that song, I said I wasn't going to talk about it? I couldn't keep it to myself. What happens is, I'm going to go tell other people, hey, you know, bro, I um, heard about Josue. I'm not saying anything, bro, but, you know, Josue. And Josue hears about it. He's going to go find some people and say, hey, you know, Dave. Then you got Team Dave. I mean, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just using this theoretical thing in the ICOC. But let's pretend that we have camps and tribes that are fine. Let's pretend. Well, where did it start? The problem was no longer the problem. The people became the problem. And then it became, it's in, and then you have open polarization and hostility. Letters, rocks. Everything starts going out. And then in the end, it probably results in a change of structure. Church splits, divorce, something. Now you're like, why is this important? Because trust and communication starts to drop as you go up stages. If you have a situation like this, people have been fighting, you've not assessed it, and you, you say this, why don't you guys sit in a room and just work it out? But what if they're in stage five? Put them in a room. They'll just get a closer shot at each other. And you don't know why it's, getting, it's not working, because it's not working. Because if you get the wrong spread of conflict, you don't know where they're at. You know what's going to happen? You're going to send them in, and they're going to be worse. Because not only do they have words now, maybe they'll trade blows. See, and it becomes a problem. Do you ever do that? They just send I'm just me. I'll just use you and say, I send them in in the wrong space. Wrong tool for an event. And what happens? We can't discern that. You might go, well, David, this sounds like a lot of complicated stuff. N no, it's not. Because you learn the Bible studies. This is what we do most of the times in the Bible studies. When you as an evangelist or the leader, you're like, you know what? That person's got something more going on than the word study can fix here. So we might have to get a book for them, an extra book, extra support. 
But we put conflict, nah, you just get along. You know, bro, they pray about it. You know, they just go share their faith. It'll be fine. No, it won't be fine. It won't be fine. I'm not saying that it's bad to share your faith. I'm not saying it's bad to work in your marriage. But if we don't know what the conflict is, how far it's spread, how do we fix it? Practice makes what? Yeah, practice makes perfect till you're doing it wrong. Right? Practice makes permanent. Proper practice makes perfect. If you don't know what you're doing, what a disaster. Now, I know you might think, well, conflict resolution is easy. Yeah, it's not easy. Not if you don't assess these things. And it doesn't take very long to assess it. It's about a couple minutes thinking about it, listening to them very carefully, realizing you really don't want to work this out, do you? That pregnant pause tells you, no, they don't. They want incompatible things. And so people want, David, can you mediate this? Okay. Husband and wife. She doesn't care if he changes. She wants another dude. Why am I working on marriage counseling? She doesn't want to be married. No, 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 no. You have to be because you're a disciple. What's the next question? Do you want to be a disciple? Well, actually not. What what is a pastor doing here? That doesn't make sense. See, that took 30 seconds. As opposed to trying to help someone who doesn't want to be a disciple to stay married to a person they don't want, and I'm standing around, and all I'm doing is irritating this person, even when they do figure it out from the pig mud moment, you know? That moment, ah! And they run back to the... If I have a bad relationship with this person on their way out, they're not going to come back, not because of God, because of me, because I pressed too hard. Sometimes even God will say, you know, hey, sounds like you got to go your own way, rich young man, right? How do we know when it's time that these people need to go? You know, I know in the world that we're living in, it's all about inclusiveness and all that kind of stuff. But there's something called toxic, in- toxic inclusiveness. When you bring someone in, it's actually going to mess up the group. I heard there's like a women's meeting next door for uh, women in body image, right? How, how do you think that would be for me to sit in on it? <laughs> right? I'm a therapist. You know, I got my degrees and stuff. Yeah, but I'm a man. Yeah, but, you know, we're all evil here. No. All guys need to stay out of theirs because it's, it's toxic to include me into that meeting. It's going to change everything. But why is it like the same way in church? No, these people have to stay. Well, I know. And sometimes it works really, really bad. And we have no exit strategy for some of these folks. We just don't. And so we keep them there. And in the end, you know what happens? It kills the minister. It kills them. And they don't want to lead anymore. So just because they can't do with this one sliver of ministry, we lose the whole enchilada. Why? As opposed to, hey, can you do this better? Or even more importantly, you know what? I can't do this. Can I call somebody? Right? You kind of know when the leak is getting bad enough for you to go, you know what, honey? I think we need to get a professional because it's about a foot here. Like, it's getting a little bit Noah-like. Like, it's, it's starting to happen for me. Right? You know, the do-it-yourself is like, I got to, it's going to cost time and money and energy. But how do you know when? And so, can you imagine discerning this part where when you hear what this person has to say, can you take ownership of what you've done? Maybe not so much the intent, because a lot of times this is it. I didn't intend to do bad, but the impact was bad. So is it okay to apologize for the impact versus, hey, I didn't mean to. You can't spend your whole entire time apologizing for what you didn't mean to do. And meanwhile, all it is is like, you know, I'm sorry that happened. I didn't mean to do that, but can I help you with the impact? Can Can I apologize for that at least? And then offer, hey, you know, what can I do to make this right? And then ask them, what do you need from me? Because sometimes what I offer them is not what they need, and I don't know. What if they offer a completely different fix than what I think? And it's like, wow, I would have never thought of that. And so at the end of the day, discerning my part, and so when we think about, those are just the first two steps, just to think about, there's a lot going on, but over time, when you learn to do it well, you know what happens? It becomes like riding a bicycle. Some of us, not all of us, memorize the studies by heart. This is way less complicated than the study series. But if you don't do it, as a tool, you'll find your own way and you'll see, is it explainable, transferable, and sustainable? Well, finally, we like to jump to step three first, providing my own opinion. Doesn't matter if I know what's going on. Doesn't matter if I've even asked the person, I'm going to provide my own opinion. Once again, looking at the book, Biff, the, briefly, informally, friendly, firmly, I'm going to provide my opinion. What if it's sin, what they're doing? But only after I've listened to some, them and maybe I'm trying to find the epicenter of what's really going on. I check for their understanding of what I just said, right? And so in the end, after I discern my part, I provide my own opinion. I'm going to ask them, hey, what's your part in all this? And I use the same model, owning, offering, getting them the need, 
needs met and stuff like that. And you might think, wow, this seems like such a simple thing, but we don't do it. And in the end, you know, we develop an agreement together. And I'm not going to go through tons of that, but an agreement that's specific and clear. This is what we're doing. This is what we've agreed to, right? You don't have to write it down, but at least send an email and they send back to you. Now you have a record. And when you have a record of it, guess what happens? You can always go back. And then what you do is you do a follow-up. A follow-up a couple weeks later. Because just like Jesus taught about faith again and again, with these guys, you know, for us to follow up again and again might be, hey, hey, bro, are you okay with me? Are you fine with me? And I'll tell you, that solves it for the long run instead of just for a little while. So why don't we close with this? What was important for you? Remember the thing that you thought about? Did it come close to even answering your question or maybe inform some more stuff? I'm running around at lunch and stuff like that, but this is a book you're going to be getting from Joel. This is the manual that we put together. It's part of a a course that we're doing called the ICOC Peacemakers Conflict Resolution. Just look it up on Disciples Today. It's everywhere. You'll see that. You can sign up for the course and the program. It was only open to church leaders that were assigned in the regional families. But now it's open to every human being on the planet that can do that. But, but um, you can just look that up, okay? But thank you, Joel, for your time. And thank you, for everybody, for um, letting me be here.